Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the JK Experience. Uh, dude, can you believe it is Thanksgiving? It's hard for me to believe. It, yeah. is, it has snuck up on me. Right. It, it, well, you know, with the weather, it actually looks like it's more Thanksgiving out there right now. We're in a winter wonderland storm slash everything is shutting down around us. Yeah. I, I, you know, it's, it's funny because everybody knows that the snow is coming. Like they give us plenty of warning now. They're, the technology is such that we know it's going to dump inches or feet of snow. It's like people don't know. They're just like, oh, I'm going to get up in the morning, my usual five minutes to get to work. Yeah. And that'll be it. And so, and so because of that, you're driving to and from and people are driving like idiots. It's, it's hard. Yeah. I think the change of weather always gets people going, man. Well, I tell you what, I am, uh, I'm really excited about this year, uh, and Thanksgiving, um, in the years past, I would honestly say that I have kind of always skipped over Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving was always the precursor to the greatest month ever. Right. And the greatest month ever for multiple reasons. One of course is Christmas, the birth of Christ. And then like the second greatest birth ever. Uh, wait, is it yeah, your birthday? birthday yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, man, that was so low key. I, I was like, you guys, I, I was like, like really wait, like, I'm like, who else? Like, is it your dad's birthday? Is it, is it yeah. Kate's? No, Kate just had a birthday. Yeah. Really? Just go, oh, keep going down the line. Yeah. Keep let's go down the line. <laughs> no, but, uh, you know, obviously having a birthday in December is actually kind of weird. It's actually interesting uh, because everybody tries to double up your gift. Yeah. You know? so, so, and you grew up in a big family and I know you guys didn't grow up with a lot of money. So yeah. I'll bet you got shortchanged. Oh, big time. And yeah. my, my folks' ideas of Christmas presents were the time, the perfect time of the year to give you like the new socks yeah. and then like the new underwear that you needed. You know, it's like, no, those are necessities. Yeah. yeah I should <laughs> have those that. anyway. Yes, exactly. But anyways, I am really excited about Thanksgiving this year uh, because I came across this awesome, awesome story about the history of our country. Mm -hmm. And um, it really changed my entire perspective and appreciation for why we even have Thanksgiving. And I know that, you know, you're a history buff. You love, I, I know you love uh, Wyoming history. Yeah. That's, that's really your cup of tea, man. Mm -hmm. You could talk for days and days on that. And there's something about history that makes you appreciate your present, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, we, and, and I think about it and it, as I was on my way home last night, it's funny because it was, it was miserable cold last night. It was so cold and the snow. And I thought about, you know, what was it like for my my grandparents or my great grandparents, when they were living here in uh, no, no kidding, like a tar paper shack with a wood stove, how horrible and miserable was that for them to stick yeah. out? So, yeah, yeah so I absolutely, I'm, I'm a big buff there. Dude, they were just hardy, hardy people, right? I mean, it really, they, they, they had, I mean, everybody adjusts, I and mean, especially if, that, if that's the only conditions you know, mm -hmm. you have no idea what it could be else than, other than that, right? So, you, yeah. you make the adjustments, but. I mean, I think one of the things that I learned from this story is that our American history was full of tragedy. Our American history was full of challenges. Our American history was full of really, really hard things that people had to pursue through in order to continue to move forward with the greater cause. And I mean, what an appreciation for really how far we've come as a nation. You bet. And how easy we have it now versus what they had it. And I mean, all yeah. you got to do is look back and go. And it's not so bad here. Exactly. So the story I want to share with you guys is something, once again, I came across and I just absolutely love it. And it is, it is so important. In fact, not only did I want to talk about it on the, the podcast, but it's something we shared at the office meeting. And this is a story that I'm going to be sharing on the day of Thanksgiving with a lot of people around us, because I think it's just so impactful. So, you know, when you were growing up, we all read in the textbooks um, what Thanksgiving was about, like how it happened, what the pilgrims did and the Indians, and they all got together. And and I know that our American history through textbooks really oftentimes get pretty, gets pretty fluffed over. Yeah. You know, we don't really talk about the truth of what really happened. We don't talk about the, either the ugliness or, uh, all the challenge and the bad parts that, that people go through in order to, uh, accomplish certain things. Right. And this is a story. Like if you don't know the true story of Thanksgiving, you're going to be blown away. Just like I was with the truth in the facts and what these people went through in order for them to get to that day of celebration. Well, let's face it, Josh, so much of our history is watered down. Uh, so that so that it's easier, easily digestible. Yeah. And it, it, it kind of fits a narrative to, to where our school system can. I don't want to get into that, but it's oh, a no, lot of this stuff, is, <laughs> no, you know, and, and honestly, I mean, so much of our history gets, gets watered down to make it more acceptable and to 
uh, walk that line between separation of church and state. Yeah. And so we don't hear a lot of the, the true, true uh, stories of, of what happened. So, and this is no different, right? Yeah. Because uh, we know where you're going with the story. I know there's, there's a lot of, of faith-based uh, lessons to be learned there. Yeah. So, and I, I'm looking forward to you sharing those. Yeah. So you, you guys know the story originally of the pilgrims and then they settled on Plymouth rock and they mm-hmm. came over and then they met the Indians. And all of a sudden one day they just decided to have a celebration because of the relationship that they built with each other and the, the, the prosper, the prospering that was going on in this new world. Right. Yeah. Well, here's the truth. I mean, like, here's the backstory. Here's the things that aren't getting shared in the text. And I just absolutely love it because it doesn't, it, it's not always easy to hear some of these stories, right? So these people, the pilgrims, they called themselves a pilgrim, were actually a, really a congregation uh, of people. It's about 150 people. They were from England. They actually left England to go to Holland because they were being persecuted for their faith. Okay. And they wanted a better life, right? And, you know, we think about that in our times right now. It's like, we think that we might have a, a bad neighborhood or we think that like, you know, maybe we're getting, you know, we're, people are, uh, are persecuting us in one way or another uh, at work or mm-hmm. at school and stuff like that. No, these people left a country because it was that bad. Yeah. We want to leave the neighborhood. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And so these, as they went to Holland, I mean, they actually were doing well over there, but they still had this burden, right? They had this burden. We talk about this all the time, right? We talk about your why, we talk about your purpose. We talk about your just cause. We've often talk about like that burden on your heart, right? And these guys had this burden on their heart. These had, these guys had a burden and as a, as a congregation, um, uh, esteemed in faith, their burden was that they felt like God was calling them to this new world to establish his church. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And so 150 people, a third of them, children decided we're going to venture to the new world. And, you know, as I think about that, it's like, all right, awesome. We're going to go, Hey, we're going to leave the States and we're going to go over to England. We're going to jump into the jet, right? We're going to jump into the big plane and we're going to be over there in like 10 hours. Yeah. Awesome. Right. Dude, back in the day, right? There's no way. Yeah. That's not the way that things happen, of course, right? So their their mission, they knew, was going to be pretty challenging. So what they chose to do is they left Holland. They went back over to England to get the Mayflower, and they also wanted to get the Speedwell. Now, we never hear about the Speedwell, do we? No, no. As a matter of fact, first time I'd ever heard of it was was from you. So Yeah, and as I was, as I was hearing the story out and this played out, I, it was the same thing. It's like, well, why do you not hear about the Speedwell? And then my mind automatically goes to, oh my gosh, it sank. <laughs> you know, like, oh no, there's no Speedwell because there's no longer a Speedwell. What ended up happening is, so the 150 of these pilgrims decide to uh, lease out these, these ships. Mm-hmm. They hired crews to take them across the seas to the new world. And as they boarded and as they started their journey, the speedwell started to take on water. So 50 of them had to come back to shore and they were not, they never left. Oh, it was the Mayflower that you remember because that was the only ship that actually left the dock and continued to pursue the journey. So pretty amazing story just from the beginning. Right. And 105 of them were on that ship. And here's the thing that I thought the first thing that caught my mind was that the Mayflower was really only the size of a volleyball court. Okay. Uh, you know, my mind is always thinking back to these great, you know, the pirates of the Caribbean yeah. ships, right? Yeah. No, no. The, the, think of that a size of a volleyball court. They had three tiers. You didn't go down to the third one down there. And that's where 105 people resided for the next 66 days. Ooh. Can you imagine that? No, no, I can't. I don't, I don't like being in an airplane that you talked about, I don't know, like being in an airplane for two or three hours, yeah. you know, sitting next to somebody I may not know very well in yeah. my personal space. No, 60 yeah. days. No, thanks. 105 people. A third of them were children. There was one pregnant woman on there as well, too. They're on this ship for 66 days. Okay. Maybe we can do it. You know, we just talked about 75 hard, you mm-hmm. know, da, da, da. They went through some of the most horrific storms in order to get over. In fact, it was so bad that the mass of the sails would tip from side to side. So it'd be on the left side to the right side. And the only way that people were not getting hurt is that they had to get buckled into these ships. And think about that too. A third of them are children. None of them are sailors. 
I don't know about you, but I get seasick. Oh, yeah. So what do you think's happening on this ship as you're getting tossed and turned through the waves, right? And it's probably happened on like day two or day three, and it ain't getting any better. And the last time when I was doing this research and looking at those ships, there were no bathrooms on that ship, like oh. they're on the airplanes, right? Yeah. So think of that. Not only are they vomiting because of the the the, uh, the seas there's no place to go to the bathroom and because the storms were so bad these people were locked down inside those cabins for who knows how long at a, a period of time right and so you've got all of that filth all of that disgustingness floating around the entire time right they had an opportunity 30 days into this journey to turn around and they chose not to now, if that's not knowing your greater why, if yeah. that's not knowing a greater purpose, I don't know what is, dude. That's a pretty even powerful moment right there for me when I'm thinking about, would they continue on this journey? Would I continue on this journey? You know, it's, it's funny because how many times do we, do we get an opportunity to, to take an out and we go, yeah, I think I'm going to, I'm going to play it safe. I'm going to, I'm going to turn back. I'm going to stay where I'm at in my business, in my life, in my, in whatever. And that's that moment. That's that pivotal moment. And here was these people going, what do we do? Right. Yeah. And so they're, so they're on this journey. They're halfway through it. And in fact, this is the thing too, is right. Is we all know, like they didn't know how long the journey was going to last. They mm -hmm. didn't know that it was only that, that 30 days in, they're only halfway through. They had an idea, but you never know with weather patterns. Sure. You have, you have no idea and you have no idea how bad it's going to get. You know, it's already been pretty bad enough for the captain to come back and say, Hey, here's an opportunity to turn around if you guys, cause this is not getting any better. Right. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting too, hearing that the crew that they had hired, of course, was not Christians either. In fact, one of the members kept on calling them, um, Psalm singing puke stockings, which I thought that was pretty easy. I was pretty creative <laughs> if you think about that, but wow. like, this is what one of the crew members was talking to them about because once again, they were religious. So they're probably singing Psalms all the time uh -huh. to keep their faith. And then of course, obviously they're puking because the torrentious seas, right? So you have not only horrible situations, but you also have people that are cheering you on to fail as well too. Right. Yeah. So all of this is going on. They decide to continue to move forward. And so finally, after 66 days at sea, they finally land in the new world. And you're going, all right, this is the time to celebrate. That's when Thanksgiving happens, right? Yes. They land 500 miles north of where their destination was, which was in Virginia. They land in Cape Cod. Okay, that sounds okay. Cape Cod can be very beautiful in the summertime, right? <laughs> I mean, if you've ever seen pictures, sure. if you've ever talked to people, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. The problem is, is that they also landed in Cape Cod in December. And I don't know about you, if you've ever been to the East Coast in the wintertime, it is brutally cold out there. Yeah. I mean, it is horribly cold. I spent some time in college in Iowa and I've never experienced freezing rain like I did out there where you'd see your car, but you couldn't get to it because there was like an inch and a half of ice over it. Right. Yep. That's what Cape Cod would have been like. It was just absolutely frigid over there. And so they land exuberated to get off these stinking ships. And then they just have miles and miles of beaches and they have no place to live. And then they're, so they're running back onto the ship. Yeah. That's how bad the conditions were, right? Can Yikes. you imagine that? Just think of that in your life, right? You go through a chapter that's really challenging and you're like, thank God I'm out of that chapter. And then you get into the next chapter and it's even worse than it was before, right? We don't think about that. Yeah. So, and, and you said this and it's, it's again, a great analogy. How many times you get into that next chapter and it's just as bad or worse than what you just survived. You're like, Hey, I want to go back. Yeah. I want to go back a right? chapter. So, um, great analogy as far as, as far as that goes. So they land, they have no idea what to do. They don't know. This is a different, I mean, this is a different agriculture too. So they have no idea how to farm in this. Yeah. It's the dead of winter. They can't plant. They don't know how to maneuver the seas either. So they don't really know how to fish the seas. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're landing now and it's like, things don't get better. Right. So they're starting to build, they're starting to try to, to, to figure their way through this. But the entire time, this is kind of eerie. Think about this. The entire time they're doing this, they have the provisions to know that somebody is watching them. They just don't know who it is. Mm -hmm. Think about how scary that would be. You know, as a father, uh, as a man, you know, you're, you're in charge of your family. You've got your kids over there with your wife and you know, in the distance, there's always somebody lurking. You don't know who or how many, man. Yeah. That's gotta be a little bit scary, right? Yeah. So they go feeling for sure. Oh, definitely. Right. So they go through this, they, they go through this and eventually one of the Indians comes out and we all think of Squanto. Squanto was the one that was, uh, that actually helped, uh, 
the the pilgrims realized how to crop, that they realized how to farm, they realized how to fish, right? I thought this was amazing. There was actually before Squanto, there was an actually there's an Indian named Samoset that he had, he originally was captured by English sea captains and then uh, brought back to England. He learned English. He learned the English ways. Mm -hmm. And then he was able to, I don't know if he escaped or if somehow he was able, he was released, but he came back to the, the, the new world and he came back and I absolutely love this. So this guy is six foot. He's, he's an Indian. He's a big dude, wow. right? Because if you think back in the day, pilgrims were actually pretty small. Mm -hmm. They were five, 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 six at the most. So here's this giant of a man coming out and the first thing he says to them is do you have beer what i don't think they said that in texas right they don't let people I, i've never had my children come back home and say hey guess what uh, guess what uh, sam has said, said to the the pilgrims right no but this is actual fact i'm not making this up because i heard it on the internet first of all right it's, it's always true it's on true. the internet uh but no it's actually in recordings and this is the first thing he said and you know obviously not knowing the history you don't know why would he ever say this right is this a way for him to be like hey you're a friend and let's just have a beer together to show to share yeah. that relationship right the reason why um, the pilgrims brewed beer is because back in England, the water was so toxic, so bad mm. that it actually got people sick and people passed away and died from it. Right. So they would brew beer because they were able to burn off all of the stuff. It had alcohol in it. Sure. And so it was actually healthy for the pilgrims and the Indians knew that. And the Indian knew that too. So he knew that they were getting the barley. They knew they were getting the hops. And of course they probably also were getting a little bit of a buzz too. So, um, you know, Back in the day, he probably needed a little bit of a buzz as hearty as everything was, right? Yeah, yeah. So he, he asked, and that's how they got to know. That's how they, that, that friendship started back then. So that was pretty awesome. You know, and for me to hear that, I was like, okay, there's a little bit of relief in this story finally, right? All mm -hmm. the hardship, the 60 days, 66 days at sea. I can't imagine showing up to the shores of Cape Cod in the dead of winter and going, oh my gosh, we are actually going into a worse chapter in our life here. And in fact, the chapter was so bad that they called it the starving time. So things got so bad that they had to ration their food. And I think a, part, a really important part of this story is that the miraculous thing about this entire journey thus far was that not one of the pilgrims died on the way over. Think about that. The storms, um, the um, uh, the sickness, all the things that were going on. A third of them were children, mm -hmm. right? Not one of them died on this 66-day journey. I was absolutely enthralled and, and could not believe that. The only one that did die was a crew member, mm -hmm. and it happened to be the one that was making fun of them. Yeah, no kidding. How crazy is that? Yeah. So I don't know if God was if the hand of God came down in spite of that dude or what, but how about it? Yeah, don't call anybody ever a psalm signing, uh, singing, puke, stalking. stalking. <laughs> <laughs> if they'll never even roll off your your mouth, right? So they go into this star. So they go into this season, this next chapter, and, and it's called the starving time. And the horrible part about this is that literally fifty percent of the pilgrims died. They had a hundred and four make it. 50% of them didn't make it through the winter. And there wasn't one family that didn't see a loss in their family. Think about that, you know, as I was talking to Kate uh, and I'm saying, you know, hey, would we do this journey? I mean, I know my answer, but like, would you do this journey because you felt like there was a calling in your life and we knew that there's a high probability that some of us, all of us would die on the boat ride over. Mm -hmm. Cause we would think that as soon as we'd land, things would get great. And now we're into this amazing new world and God would bless us. Right. So we knew that we, we believe that the hardest part of the journey was going to be the, the seas. Yeah. When you land, it got even worse. I don't know if I would ever have the courage to put my kids through that. That's a hard spot to put those, those kids. I mean, you know, as, as parents, we realize that our job is to protect those children and raise them up to where they become self-sufficient. Right. And at some point you have to realize you're putting those children in harm's way Yeah, in, 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 a, in an effort to pursue your calling or right. your burden. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's tough. Yeah. As I thought about this, I thought of two scenarios, right? One is that we are going to make this decision and one of our children would die. Okay. Well, which one? Right. Or maybe my wife would die. Mm -hmm. The other scenario that, uh, that hit me just as hard too is like, well, what if I die? And then now I leave my 
spouse with four children to raise in a new world with absolutely no guidance or no husband to take care of them. Right. And I just, I was like, that, that was just a powerful moment for me to see, like, this is how bad they believed in their just cause. This is how yeah. bad they believed in their purposes that they were willing to not only put their own lives online, they're willing to put their family's lives on the line. That is powerful, dude. That is. That is, and, and again, it speaks to to how how much they believed in this in this why or this special purpose. Yeah, so they're in this starving period, and one of the most significant things that um, happened through that that is the symbolic part that really um, hit with me is they rationed their food, and it came down to five kernels of corn per person per day. That's all they had for themselves and for this. But this time they were also partnering with the Indians. And so the Indians were able to the same thing. They had five kernels of corn a day. We did that example today at the office meeting. Yeah. And it was amazing just to see that. Like, what does that look like in front of you? Like, and then uh, to me, I'm like, okay, so do you eat one at a time? Do you eat them all together? And then try to fill it through. I mean, think about all of those processes that you're going through. And then you're also as a father, um, or as a, as a parent, you're also going, I don't want it. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to give it to your kids. Right. And then uh, just the psychology that you have to go through in order to survive and, and what's the best way to take care of your family, man. Like I just, it was a pretty powerful moment to think about all of the things that these people were sacrificing for, for the just cause. Yeah. You know, you're, you, you, you've got this great quandary as, as the head of the family, right? You can either divide your five um, amongst your wife and children if you do that, you might not have enough energy to go out and do the things that you need to yeah. do in an effort to sustain them long term. Right? Exactly. So you have to you have to consume some of that because yeah. if you don't, you're not going to be around for them. And then who's going to provide for them? Yeah. So, yeah, uh, just absolutely amazing. So uh, the story does get better. I promise, um, you know, they get through that season and that's when Squanto teaches them uh, through that how to farm and how to um, um, fish Mm -hmm. and, and, and then they have a, they reap a huge harvest. Uh, they have a plentiful harvest and the governor of, um, Plymouth at that time, they decided to do a Thanksgiving and it was a four day event, which is kind of cool, right? It had sports, it had everything. It even had a food fight at one point in time. It brought, brought out, which is kind of funny to think about that at, you know, like a food fight really, but they did, they enjoyed, they enjoyed each other. They, they had Thanksgiving for everything that they had. Now, does that word Thanksgiving? Thanksgiving mean anything different now? Oh, I'm here to tell you. Right. You know, and, and that's just it. You know, we, we talk about, um, you know, the, the, the partnerships that they had with the natives and how, you know, they taught them how to, and that's, that's what's taught to us, right? Yeah. It, yeah. It's all, all changed now. Talk yeah. about a paradigm shift. Absolutely. And so as I think about this and as we're into this day of celebration and Thanksgiving, you know, first of all, it's just, it's not another holiday to just kind of pass over to get us through to December, right? It is forever changed my perspective of what was done in order for us to, to, to do experiences today, right? What was done in the generations beyond be, uh, past in the past from us in order for us to experience what we get to today. And I know that a lot of us take that stuff for granted. I mean, dude, I'm 43 years old and I never knew that story. I never heard that story. When I look at corn, I will never look at corn the same way. Yeah. Right. And so as you're, uh, as you're listening to this, I want you to think about a couple of things. One is we always talk about what we're grateful for. Mm-hmm. And I want you to ask the question, why are you grateful for it? Right. We have a, we have a tradition that during every Thanksgiving, we all get around the table and everybody says what they're grateful for, but we're going to change it up this year because I want to know more why, you know, it's great to know what you're grateful for. I'm grateful for the new code. I'm grateful for the new car. I'm grateful for the money in the bank account. I'm grateful for the relationship, but why are you grateful for those things in your life? And I bet you, uh, once you think about the things that you're, why you're grateful for it, the things that you are grateful for are going to change. You bet they are. Right. If you say, well, I'm grateful for my iPhone. Well, why are you grateful for your iPhone? Um, so I can play games. Okay. Well that, that sounds very superficial. Okay. You know what? I got to be grateful for something better. Yes. Right? Yes. So I just absolutely love that. The other thing that, um, I want, I want to challenge people with is is what traditions maybe have you let go of that maybe meant something in your family and you just forgot to keep doing them, right? Is there anything mm-hmm. that you can do that's a tradition that'd be awesome to kind of reinstate it, mm-hmm. 
Right. And I know a lot of us, I mean, I've been guilty in the past before is I think some of them are, maybe they're kind of corny or I'm a little bit embarrassed to bring them up. And so like one year leads into the next year, which is in the next year. And then five years later, eventually it's just forgotten and you don't ever, you don't have those traditions anymore. Right. So I think it's always important to know where you came from. I think it's always important to know who you are. Right. Yeah. So what traditions maybe have you forgotten that were a part of your family and your family heritage and history that maybe you need to start um, putting back into it? Yeah. So, you know, in, in spite, as you were talking about that, it's funny because, you know, in, in spite of my, my rough and rugged exterior appearance, I'm a pretty sentimental dude. Yeah. Right. And I'm, I'm big on tradition. And as you were going through those, I'm like, man, what, what traditions have we let go? So here's what I'm challenged to do. I'm going to, I'm going to go visit with my, with my children and say, Hey, what are things that we used to do? that we don't do anymore mm -hmm. and should we get back on those? Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a great point because I, you know, those are a big part of that. Um, as, as I get older and, and my children get older in there, uh, we were having a discussion, my oldest son and I, we were having a discussion last night about, you know, when it's time for him and his girlfriend to start their family, you know, once our educations are complete mm -hmm. and those traditions that, that, that he lived through, that's what's going to be passed on. And yeah. to a certain extent, that's my legacy. Yep. And if those traditions are going by the wayside, what, what am I passing on? Yeah. 